The Viet Cong were winning the war for a larger reason than this ruinous corruption and these other maladies of the Saigon regime, Van began to realize. They were leading a social revolution in the South Vietnamese countryside and were harnessing its energy to their cause. Van could understand this social revolution because his childhood and youth enabled him to identify with the anger and aspirations of poor Vietnamese. His refusal to abandon the roads gave him an opportunity to see the revolution occurring. Most days he and Ramsey were out among the peasantry, escorting their cargo trucks carrying free American bulgur. One wheat, the Vietnamese found it inedible and sold it for hog feed and used the money to buy rice, cooking oil, powdered milk, and other supplies to groups of refugees, or trying to move forward one of their programs designed to win the sympathy of the population. When they drove together, they went in the Canary Yellow International Pickup. If they split up, they would take turns in their second small vehicle, the slower armored scout, and Van would go with an interpreter. The popularity of the USOM program to build Hamlet Elementary Schools first alerted Van to the social revolution the Viet Cong were leading. With only six Saigon-controlled hamlets in Haungia, Van and Ramsey had to build schools in hamlets dominated by the guerrillas if they were to build any at all. The task of building them gave Van a tangible sense of why the Viet Cong won the Vietnamese peasantry to their side. It took him into that halfway world where the guerrillas were exerting dominance and the majority of the population sympathized with them, but where the Viet Cong's clandestine government had not yet had time to fully organize the community and eradicate every vestige of the Saigon regime and the United States. In areas where they had solidified control, the Viet Cong established their own school system. They tolerated the American school building program elsewhere because the farmers were so anxious to have their children educated and many of the peasants also wanted to learn how to read and write and do basic arithmetic in evening classes. The local guerrillas and their children and relatives all benefited. While the teachers were Saigon government employees, the majority were being left undisturbed for the moment as long as they taught from a neutral point of view. These Hamlet Elementary Schools reminded Van of the country schools of the Blue Ridge foothills in which he had worked as a teacher's aide while at Ferrum. A single teacher taught all five grades. He was amazed to find 300 children enrolled in one school. The overcrowding in this case was not as much of a problem as it might have been, because this school had no walls. It consisted of a roof of U.S. Om supplied aluminum sheets spread over support beams. The roof had several holes in it from shrapnel. The teacher taught in three shifts. Van made friends right away with the teacher at the hamlet two miles from Bao Tri, where the ranger company had been wiped out. She was a homely, middle-aged woman of outgoing temperament. The fact that she was also the Viet Cong medical worker for the hamlet, a place called So Do, did not seem to affect her attitude toward Van and Ramsey. Van won her gratitude by repairing her two-room school, which had been damaged in the attack and also by arranging corrective surgery for several children he noticed there, who were afflicted with hair lip, a congenital deformity of the upper lip. The deformity is rarely seen in the United States and other industrialized countries because it is corrected at birth. These hair lip cases Van encountered at So Do and other hamlets called to mind Gene with his legs bowed by rickets, a senseless curse that modern medicine could banish. Van started a program to send all such children for treatment to the Filipino and South Korean surgical teams on loan to USOM. Many months later, he was to discover that the Sodu school teacher saved his life and Ramsey's on three occasions by persuading guerrillas who had planted a mine in the road and were waiting for them not to blow them up as they drove by. John Van also made friends with a lot of the children. Their bright and eager faces moved him. Vietnamese peasant children had a winning manner and none more so than the children of the Delta. The diet, protein rich from fish and vegetables and fruit, made them vigorous. They laughed easily and played hard, in their bare feet and shorts and loose shirts, tending the family water buffalo or shouting and kicking a can for a soccer ball in the dirt of a farmyard because they did not have a real ball or other toys and had to contrive their own fun. They were the children Van and his brothers had been in their good moments in Norfolk. He learned quickly that the children could protect him. They wanted the American who handed out the candy and gum to return, and they would sometimes warn him when there were guerrillas in a hamlet or farther down a road. Doug Ramsey was both the perfect subordinate and partner for Van at this moment and a major influence on Van's thinking at this time. 
Ramsey was, like Halberstam, another of the messianic innocents of the 1950s generation, as intense as his fence rail frame was tall. An only child, he had grown up amid the big firs and ponderosa pines on the fringes of the Grand Canyon and in the desert oasis town of Boulder City, Nevada. Ramsey's father was a minor administrator for the National Park Service, and his mother was chronically ill in a period when the government did not provide virtually limitless medical care to the dependents of civil servants. He had gone through Occidental College in Los Angeles on scholarships and loans, graduating in 1956 as one of the few students in the history of the college to achieve a perfect record, an A in every course for all four years. The State Department had drawn him away from a scholar's life after a year of graduate study at Harvard because it seemed to offer adventure and demanding service. Before he could accept his appointment to the Foreign Service, he had to give the Air Force two years, most of the time as a communications intelligence officer, to fulfill a college ROTC obligation he had acquired at Occidental. Ramsey had then found himself assigned to the State Department's Honolulu Reception Center for foreign visitors across from the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Waikiki. To rid himself of such comfortable assignments, Ramsey had volunteered for Vietnamese language training and field work in South Vietnam, arriving in May 1963 as the Buddhist crisis was about to begin. He had been given another comfortable assignment, this one as branch public affairs officer for USIS in the mountain resort city of Dalit. Diem and the Noose had weekend villas at Dalit, and the place was sophisticated and highly politicized. Ramsey's curiosity and his facility with the language had turned his months there into an education in Saigon society. Connections he formed in USIS had also gradually brought him work more to his liking, such as interview surveys of peasants in hamlets along the central coast and in the northern delta, to try to pinpoint specific grievances that motivated the farmers to support the Viet Cong. After nearly two years of patience and more volunteering, the State Department had finally given him a job he really wanted. Detail to AID an assignment to Hao Nghia in February 1965 as Assistant Province Representative. Ramsey had known nothing of his new boss when Van arrived a month later. Van had introduced himself by giving Ramsey a copy of Halberstam's Esquire article. Ramsey was an admirer of Halberstam's reporting on Vietnam in 1962 and 1963. To learn that his new superior had inspired much of that reporting and had been the hero of that miserable tale affected Ramsey deeply. Although it would have been difficult for a young man of Ramsey's inclinations not to have followed Van. In all that Ramsey was to see of him, Van was never to fall short of Halberstam's heroic portrait. The two men were in tune, in tune in their emotional commitment to the war in tune in their affection for the country they were struggling to retain. Ramsey was to write afterward of how they would sometimes abandon common sense entirely and go for a spin down a back road at the close of day to watch the falling sun turn the rice fields to burnished copper in the afterglow. The countryside that had fled to the towns and cities. If a peasant child managed to get through the five years of elementary education, he faced a dead end. The nearest secondary schools were in the district centers. The farm families were usually too poor to send the children to them, and the district schools did not go beyond the initial four years of secondary education in any case. Virtually the sole route to status in life for a peasant child was to turn to the Viet Cong and their National Liberation Front, as the most talented obviously did, because they had to draw leaders from the peasantry. The communists had no rigid educational requirements and tried to further the education of promising cadres within their own system. The commander of the Viet Cong battalion that was killing the most Saigon troops in Hao Nghia, elements of his battalion had annihilated the rangers at Sodu, was a 45-year-old native of the abandoned Du Hu district on the northeast corner of the Plain of Reeds. He was a highly respected man. At the moment, he was equivalent in rank to a major in the ARVN. He would soon be equivalent to a lieutenant colonel, as he was expanding his battalion into a regiment. He had worked his way up from the ranks, which meant that he had probably received no more than a few years of elementary education in the Saigon system he was striving to overthrow. Van's thoughts during this period were also being influenced by two of Ramsey's friends, who were to become Van's friends and comrades in the Vietnam enterprise. One was Ev Bumgardner, 
the psychological warfare specialist who had witnessed Diem's speech at Tui Hoa ten years earlier, and returned to Vietnam to run the field operations. They would stop for a moment in some red-tiled or thatched roof hamlet where the people were settling in for the night as they had for hundreds of years. They would savor the sights and smells of this land as if we were small city children on the way to camp for the first time. At night, after dinner with Han, Van and Ramsey would stay up late in their office at the province headquarters. They had electricity and the comfort of fans there, discussing the war and mulling over the events of the day. Ramsey pointed out to Van that the hunger for education Van was seeing in the peasant children would, under the Saigon system, end in frustration for those with the most intelligence and initiative. Ramsey had learned enough about South Vietnamese society to know that the educational system set up by the French and perpetuated by the Saigon regime effectively reserved secondary and higher education, and therefore the leadership positions in non-communist society, for the urban middle and upper classes and for the former landed class of USIS. The other was Frank Scotton, Bumgardner's chief operative in the field. Van had encountered Bumgardner and Scotton during his first year in the country, but had never had an opportunity to become well acquainted. Ramsey introduced him to them. Both were the kind of original men whose spirits attracted Van. Frank Scotton was a strapping 27-year-old in 1965, with a dark complexion and dark brown hair, raised on the lower middle-class side of a Boston suburb by a conscientious mother after his father, a fireman, enlisted in the Army and was killed during World War II. He was adventurous and friendly, and yet a bit rough and wary in manner. His preference in weapons was a Swedish K submachine gun he had acquired from the Special Forces. His mind was naturally unorthodox, and a fascination with guerrilla warfare and a self-steeping in the writings of Mao Zedong and von Guyen Giap had reinforced this trait. He and Bumgardner were attempting to fight the Vietnamese communists with their own methods by copying communist molds and filling them with anti-communist ideology a new program to politically indoctrinate and motivate the Saigon militiamen that Van was enthusiastic about, was an outgrowth of an experiment Scotton had conducted the previous year in Quang Nai province on the central coast. With Bumgardner's encouragement and the help of an imaginative army major named Robert Kelly and several CIA agents, Scotton had organized 45-man commandos that were an imitation of the Viet Cong's armed propaganda teams. Scotton's commandos had not stopped the guerrillas from taking over almost all of Quang Gai. By May 1965, the regime was considering whether to abandon the province capital itself. But they had performed as no other Saigon units ever had helping the farmers propagandizing in guerrilla-dominated sections, laying ambushes that actually did surprise guerrilla bands at night, and sneaking into hamlets to assassinate local Viet Cong leaders. Bumgardner was at first glance the contrasting mentor that an action-oriented type like Scotton seemed to need. A cerebral and restrained man, diminutive and balding now at forty years. Along with Bumgardner's even temper and self-effacing manner went a capacity to think and behave with the same unorthodoxy Scotton did. The passion in Bumgardner showed in his dogged pursuit of the war, and in a zest, concealed from strangers, to put himself in dangerous places and to hear bullets buzz and snap. Whenever Van and Ramsey went into Saigon on business together and stayed overnight, they would get together with Bumgardner and Scotton to talk about the war. While Bumgardner and Scotton reflected the same inability as the rest of their countrymen to grasp the nationalist basis of Vietnamese communism, they were knowledgeable about current social and political conditions in South Vietnam. Both men were fluent in Vietnamese, and Bumgardner had married into a Chinese family that had lived in Vietnam for generations. They were convinced, like Ramsey, that the Viet Cong drew their greatest strength from the conditions that nurtured social revolution. They thought that anti-communist nationalism was still a viable alternative in the South, but only if there was a complete transformation of the Saigon regime. The United States could not simply take over the regime as Van's reflex had told him and run the country through Vietnamese front men. The regime had to be somehow changed into an entirely different kind of government that was responsive to the desires of the rural population. Unless a change was made, Bumgardner and Scotton believed the war could not be won. Even if the U.S. Army were to occupy the whole country and crush the guerrillas, the rebellion would break out again after the American soldiers had gone home. 
What Ramsey Bumgardner and Scotton said sounded right to Van because of what he saw in Hau Nia. By the end of May, he had seen and heard enough to express his new, and for Van, extraordinary appreciation of the war in a letter to General York. If it were not for the fact that Vietnam is but a pawn in the larger East-West confrontation, and that our presence here is essential to deny the resources of this area to Communist China, then it would be damned hard to justify our support of the existing government. There is a revolution going on in this country, and the principles, goals, and desires of the other side are much closer to what Americans believe in than those of GVN, the Saigon government. I realize that ultimately when the Chinese brand of communism takes over, that these revolutionaries are going to be sadly disappointed, but then it will be too late for them, and too late for us to win them. I am convinced that even though the National Liberation Front is communist-dominated, that the great majority of the people supporting it are doing so because it is their only hope to change and improve their living conditions and opportunities. If I were a lad of 18 faced with the same choice, whether to support the GVN or the NLF, and a member of a rural community, I would surely choose the NLF. For 11 years, Van thought. The United States had been wasting Vietnamese and American lives and hundreds of millions of dollars attempting to preserve the unpresentable old order in South Vietnam. The task before him was so much larger than anything he had envisioned in Denver when he had decided to return to the war. What he had to do was to devise a strategy that was constructive rather than destructive, a strategy that could shape South Vietnam into a nation able to stand with the United States in the global struggle for the underdeveloped lands. After devising that strategy, he would have to translate it into a program and then into action by selling the program to those on high. The idealism that Garland Hopkins and Ferrum had instilled in him expressed itself in a desire to Americanize the world. When he looked at these farm youngsters, he did not simply see Vietnamese children. He saw potential Vietnamese counterparts of Lansdale's Filipinos native leaders so infused with American values and so grateful for American help that they would naturally make the cause of the United States their own. Had we begun 11 years ago, he said in a lecture in Denver while on home leave that fall, we'd now be having the leaders emerging that we want. I think we can still do it through children like this. The war was also reaching a juncture that Van saw as an opportunity to implement a new strategy. By early June 1965, Westmoreland had more than 50 Thuosan American military men in South Vietnam, including nine battalions of Marines and Army paratroops. Although the Johnson administration was being vague and public about the decisions it was reaching, more U.S. battalions were clearly on the way. They were arriving just in time. The Saigon government had been preparing to evacuate all five northern provinces along the central coast, the whole of the I Corps zone where the Marines now held the airfield at Pu Bai, near the former imperial capital of Hue, as well as the port and airbase at Da Nang below it. The Saigon generals had even developed a secret plan to move JGS headquarters from the handsome compound de Latre de Tassigny, had built next to Tan Son Nut, to the old French army school for military orphans on the Vung Tau Peninsula, Cap Saint-Jacques, 40 miles southeast of the city. The peninsula was easy to defend, and the generals would be a few minutes from ships in the open sea there. They were uncertain whether they would be able to defend the remnants of the central highlands they still held long enough to shift the burden to the Americans. The principal mountain towns of Kantum, Pleiku, and Ban Methuot had become fragile islands accessible only by air. In Haungia, there were signs everywhere that the regime would not see 1966 without an American rescue. Minings and ambushes had become so frequent along the main road to Saigon Route 1 that Van and Ramsey would pass smashed jeeps and trucks from which no one had yet bothered to remove the bodies. Worse, they occasionally spotted part of a body beside a wreck. On some mornings, the guerrillas blew up military vehicles within 200 yards of the police checkpoints at each end of Bao Trai. The policemen stationed in the sentry boxes the night before had probably heard the guerrillas digging the mines into the road or had watched in the moonlight, as the Viet Cong had strung the wires to the detonators in the brush nearby, yet they had said nothing. Desertions were also becoming more significant. The chiefs of two hamlets right next to Bao Trai, two of the six supposedly pacified hamlets in the province, were no longer willing to depend on the insurance they purchased by assisting the Viet Cong covertly. They deserted openly to the guerrillas. One took his deputy, and almost all of the militia platoon in the hamlet with him. 
Van and Ramsey had been fond of this PF platoon. Most of its members were local teenagers who would cheer whenever the Americans brought them bulgur wheat or cooking oil to supplement their ridiculous salaries. The happy-go-lucky teenagers shocked their American friends by wiping out part of a pacification team stationed in the neighborhood before deserting. The nerves of those on the Saigon side who did not desert were so frayed that panic was a flash away. The village center of Dewlap along the road two miles north of Bao Trai had been attacked several times in recent months. One morning the place was swept by a rumor that a squad of guerrillas, a single squad, was about to arrive. First the regular police, then the heavily armed combat police, then a ranger battalion headquarters and one of its companies fled in terror. They all straggled back after the rumor proved false. Van and Ramsey would have taken less notice if the panic had occurred at 2 a.m. in the pre-dawn darkness, when some sort of attack might have been developing. The time had been 10 a.m. Van had never changed the views he had expressed to Ziegler back in 1962 on the folly of trying to fight the war with American troops. If the war is to be won, he had written Lodge's assistant from Denver in the spring of 1964, then it must be done by the Vietnamese. Nothing would be more foolhardy than the employment of U.S. or any other foreign troops in quantity. We could pour our entire army into Vietnam and accomplish nothing worthwhile. He felt the same way roughly a year later as the Marines and Army infantrymen started to arrive. Not that he was unhappy to see them come. Without them, South Vietnam would, he remarked, have gone down the drain. Their arrival meant an end to the much-feared danger that, as the regime neared collapse, some group of neutralist or pro-communist politicians would of civilian casualties. The primary, if unspoken, mission of the American troops would be political. They would provide the muscle to stop the bacchanal of coups and recoups and bring the Saigon generals to heel. Behind the shield of the U.S. Army and the Marine Corps, the United States would take over the regime and gradually turn it into a government whose leaders were not fundamentally corrupt men. The Vietnamese soldiers of the ARVN and the regional and popular forces would do most of the fighting in the countryside, not the American troops. The Saigon forces would have to be reorganized and reformed as they carried the burden of defeating the Viet Cong and beginning the pacification of the hamlets. This goal could be accomplished, Van felt, by creating a joint command in which Americans would issue the orders. He recognized by now that the rank and file of the Saigon forces were as disgusted with their leadership as he was. He was convinced that they would respond to competence and discipline and the form a government in Saigon and demand that the United States withdraw. Kai and his fellow generals could hold on as long as they had American guns to protect them. The Vietnamese communists obviously lacked the capacity to eject a large U.S. force that could be supported by sea and air. What troubled Van was that these American soldiers would now be sent out to fight the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese when regulars of Hanoi's Vietnam People's Army, called the NVA for North Vietnamese Army, by the U.S. military, who had started to march down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to reinforce the guerrillas. Given the inability of American troops to distinguish friend from foe, the potential for mindless carnage was enormous. The sensible course, Van believed, would be to use the American troops to secure Saigon and the ports and airfields and those inland cities and towns that could not, as a matter of prestige, be lost to the communists. The U.S. soldiers would serve as a garrison and an emergency reserve. They could be employed offensively in those rare instances when a large Viet Cong or NVA unit had been well located. The circumstances favored the Americans, and there was little danger of success these would bring. Van began to focus his late-night talks with Ramsey and their discussions in Saigon with Bumgardner and Scotton on the core of a new strategy. The details of a program to attract the peasantry and change the nature of Saigon society. Van had been fighting a private guerrilla war with the contract per since his discovery that the man had corrupted another aid official with women. He had a weapon he could use against the crooked builder. USM regulations required Van to sign a release before the contractor could be paid for a completed project. Van made a point of catching the contractor in the theft of aluminum roofing sheets. He drove to a recently finished maternity clinic and to a school, climbed up and counted the number of sheets in the roofs, and checked the records to see how many sheets had been issued to the contractor for the buildings. Van then refused to sign payment releases until the contractor agreed to reimburse the U.S. government for the missing sheets. 
The conflict escalated in the latter part of May, when the contractor visited Han to offer him the same 10% kickback arrangement on contracts that the builder had had with the last province chief. He advised Han not to take Van seriously. The aid official corrupted by the contractor now occupied a staff position at USOM headquarters in Saigon. The contractor said his American friend had informed him that Van was considered a troublemaker and would be replaced soon. Han did not react. That evening, he tipped Van off to what the contractor had told him. Van asked Han to cancel every contract the crooked builder had in the province. Han would not commit himself to such drastic action, but he did not seem unwilling if Van could sufficiently discredit the builder. A week later, the contractor was back to see Han. He enlarged his proposition to make it more attractive. The resources and population control program that was supposed to deny the Viet Cong useful commodities required export-import certificates for goods and raw materials, such as sugar, entering or leaving the province. The certificates were commonly sold for graft. The builder had handled the sales for the last province chief. He offered to perform the same service for Han, for a percentage, of course. Han explicitly declined the offer this time, and again repeated the conversation to Van. By this point, the contractor had learned that Van was attempting to expel him from Haung Gia, and he correctly assumed that the new province chief would not be acting so strangely were it not for Van's encouragement. The Saigonese had become practiced over the years at striking a pose of innocence and injured national pride whenever a genuine interest like corruption was threatened by Americans. The contractor, a member of a prominent Southern Catholic family, was adept at the game. He wrote Van a letter upbraiding him for behaving like the French colonial bosses when they dominated our country. The next move in the game was for the contractor to have his friend at USOM headquarters send a copy of the letter up the chain of command ladder to get Van transferred out of Haun Gia. Van guessed this would be the next play. He wrote the contractor a reply laying out the facts of his thievery, but held back the carbon that would normally have gone to USOM headquarters. He suspected that the bribed aid official would divert it or attempt to discredit it. A summons to Saigon soon came, as Van had expected, from Wilson's deputy, a career civilian aid officer. The deputy immediately began to lecture Van on how to behave toward Vietnamese. When he was unable to restrain himself any longer, Van asked whether the deputy wanted to hear his side of the story. The deputy said that he did not, that he was merely trying to help Van. Unless he could give his side of the story, Van said, they would have to end the meeting. The deputy grudgingly consented to listen. Van then described the bribed official's relationship with the contractor and the larger schemes of graft the builder had been running with the last province chief. He gave the deputy a carbon of his reply to the contractor as well as copies of earlier correspondence between them about vanished building materials. Van could see that Wilson's deputy was unhappy. He apparently feared a scandal. He did say that Van's account and the full correspondence told a story considerably different from what he had heard. At noon on June 22, Van was driving down Route 1 toward Kuchi, feeling good about his first campaign against corruption in Haung Gia. The bribed aid official had not stood up well under questioning. Van had been asked to write a confidential memorandum about the man's relationship with the contractor. The man was in so much hot water at USOM headquarters that he was subsequently to transfer to another country. Wilson's civilian deputy was changing his opinion of Van and was to become one of Van's staunchest promoters in aid. Han had not yet canceled the last of the builder's contracts, but he seemed about to do so. Van had become confident enough of victory a week earlier to announce to Han and to one of Han's deputies that no matter what the official finding of the investigation, he was not going to issue the contractor another bag of cement or a single sheet of roofing as long as he was USOM representative in Haun Gia. Van was alone in the Canary Yellow International Pickup. He had talked that morning to the district chief at Trang Bang farther up Route 1 about some self-help projects and was on his way down to Chi to meet Han. The province chief was also out traveling that morning to present some piglets to farmers participating in the USOM pig raising and corn growing program. Despite his dislike of convoys, Van was going to join Han's convoy out of courtesy so that they could drive back to Bao Tri together for lunch there with a touring USIA official. Van had just passed a dangerous spot at a bridge named for the stream it spanned Soy Sao, Sao Creek. The province military advisors had nicknamed the bridge Soy Kaidi because so many minings and ambushes occurred nearby. 
he spotted a group of men a short distance off his side of the two-lane tarmac road. Three of them were armed and dressed in the black pajama-like garb that the peasants, the Viet Cong, and the Saigon militia all wore. They were walking in front of six young men who were stripped to the waist. The three armed men beckoned to Van to stop. Thinking that they were militia who needed help in some emergency, Van slowed down. As he did so, one of them raised a rifle and pointed it at him, changing Van's mind about who was beckoning to him. He slammed in the clutch with his left foot, shoved the gear stick up into second, and began to accelerate away, smiling and waving out the open door window of the truck in the hope that if these men were Viet Cong with prisoners, they might hesitate long enough for him to get away. The man who had been signaling most vigorously for Van to stop pushed down his companion's rifle, smiled, and waved back. In a few moments, Van was clear of them and speeding down the pothole tarmac at 70 miles an hour. No guerrillas had ever before signaled to him to stop and behaved so oddly. He was wondering whether they really had been Viet Cong when he heard a volley of shots and the crack of bullets missing the pickup's cab. He ducked instinctively, just in time to keep his eyes from being filled with fragments of glass as more bullets punched holes through the windshield. The little truck careened off to the left into a graveyard that extended down both sides of the road. Van jerked himself erect to get control of the vehicle and saw his ambushers. About a dozen guerrillas strung out along the left side of the road for the length of a football field. The pickup was headed right for them. Van kept his foot pressed on the accelerator to retain every bit of power and speed he could. As the truck fishtailed wildly down the edge of the graveyard and Van fought the wheel to bring it back up on the road, he could see the guerrillas closest to him scatter to avoid being run over. Two of the Viet Cong, both armed with Thompson submachine guns, were calmer than their fellows. They stood where they were and continued to shoot. Van stared at the second of the two submachine gunners after he had wrestled the truck back to the road and was hurtling through the ambush position. The man did not shoot at the engine or the tires. Instead, he looked directly at Van behind the wheel and kept firing short bursts from the Thompson gun to try to kill him. The bullets from the last burst as the truck passed, the gorilla came through the open door window in front of Van's face, one bullet smashing its way back out through a corner of the windshield on the far side of the cab. The truck plunged off the road again into the cemetery on the right, apparently when the gorillas shot out a tire. Van fought the vehicle back to the tarmac once more and thought he was free of the ambush when he heard a new burst of firing from behind. He turned to see three more gorillas shooting at him. They were probably a second element of the ambush party who had been overconfident about the skill of the main group and had relaxed their readiness enough for him to dash past before they could begin firing. He was still going so fast that he had to brake hard at a police checkpoint three-quarters of a mile down the road. One of the policemen came running up to the truck with a first aid kit, but as far as Van could tell, his only wounds were scores of tiny cuts from the bits of flying glass on his right arm and hand that had been holding the top of the steering wheel and on his head and on his chest, where his open shirt formed a V. He indicated fifteen guerrillas to the policeman by flashing his hands. They nodded. From their sentry box, they had been able to see the last three guerrillas shooting at him. Van decided to drive the remaining four and a half miles to Kuchi right away, riding on the rim of the wheel with the blown tire, in the hope of contacting a couple of helicopter gunships that had been over the vicinity late that morning. It took the district advisor half an hour to raise the aircraft on the radio, and the pilots could see nothing when they reached the ambush site. In the meantime, Van described the ambush to Han and the district chief, and then joined Han's convoy to Bao Tri after putting on the spare tire. The ARVN medic at the province headquarters cleaned the glass from the cuts, there were about a hundred of them, and painted them with disinfectant in time for Van to have lunch with the visiting USIA official. The ambush had obviously not been a happenstance. There was only one vehicle in Haung Yia painted canary yellow. The smile and the goodbye wave from the gorilla who decided to leave Van to the ambush party and the fact that the ambushers opened fire as soon as they sighted the pickup showed that they had been after him or Ramsey. He guessed that he was the target because he was the senior man, and how Nghia was so overpopulated with informers that the guerrillas would have had little trouble learning about his appointments and guessing his likely route that morning. Although he could never prove it, he suspected he had been set up by the contractor or the Kuchi district chief, whose graft from building materials he had also begun to pinch. He was sure the two men were involved in contraband dealings with the guerrillas or were paying the Viet Cong a percentage of their graft as protection money, or both. 
it would have been a simple thing for either man to have requested his death. The best surmise is that the request came from the contractor. The man was to play both sides during a subsequent career as a Saigon newspaper publisher and politician, and thus probably had better lines to the Viet Cong in Haungia in 1965 than the district chief. He certainly had more reason to want Van dead. Han canceled the last of his contracts the day after the ambush. John Van did not change his driving habits, but he did change the color of the pickup. He had it repainted blue. He also began traveling with a carbine slung across his lap and several grenades on the seat beside him. He had lived, he knew, because of the accidental swerve into the ambushers and because they had been such poor shots. He calculated that they had fired 150 to 200 rounds in all, and he could count only four bullet holes through the metal of the truck, including one through the door on his side. A lot more bullets had come through the windshield. The interior of the cab was damaged from bullets ricocheting off the inner roof and sides. Yet the ambushers' overall performance had been bad marksmanship. Even the submachine gunners had fired from the hip in gangster movie style instead of taking aim. The little truck had also saved him by proving to be as tough as he was. The mechanics at the U.S. OM motor pool in Saigon discovered while repairing it that every engine mount had snapped in two from the jolt of plunging off the road at high speed, but neither the steering nor the engine power had been affected. Van savored beasting the gorillas as much as he did his encounter with mortal danger. He wrote in his diary that night, Drove through the ambush. Must have been embarrassing to VC that many men failing to get one vehicle and driver. Close. His small victory over the ambushers and the contractor seems to have spurred Van on toward the development of a formal proposal for the strategy he had been discussing with Ramsey and with Bumgardner and Scotton. Most of his writing time went into official reports. The absence of diary entries for the month of July indicates the extent to which he was putting what personal writing time he allowed himself into the shaping of a draft. He was also being spurred on by a White House announcement on July 8th that Henry Cabot Lodge would be returning to South Vietnam later in the summer to replace Maxwell Taylor as ambassador. Van had great expectations of leadership from Lodge and hopes for himself too because of his political and personal acquaintanceship with the ambassador. Van's emotions and those of the three other men were also impelling them to try to devise something better than a higher level of violence, with no hope of a meaningful conclusion. The war had reached the point, they agreed, where only blind men could claim that continuing it indefinitely was in the interest of the Vietnamese. As bad as a communist Vietnam would be, and Van and his friends envisioned it as a place of Maoist agricultural communes, where even marital sex would be state-supervised, it would be a lesser evil than torturing these peasants with endless war. Tri was mortared during the attack on the Ranger Company. A shell crashed through the roof of the province jail and exploded in its single large cell, killing eight of the prisoners and wounding 26 others. Many of the dead and wounded were captured guerrillas. Near the end of July, when Van was well into the first draft of his strategy proposal, another of those atrocities occurred that revolted him and Ramsey. Eleven civilians, three of them children, were literally blown to pieces when a tri-wheel Lambretta minibus in which they were riding on the road from Ku Chai to Bao Tri ran over a new type of anti-tank mine the guerrillas had started to plant. The old-fashioned Viet Cong mine permitted discrimination because it had to be triggered by a man using a hand detonator attached to control wires. This new type was the sort employed by modern armies. It had a pressure detonator, probably American-made and captured or bought from ARVN stocks that was set off by the weight of a vehicle passing over it. The Viet Cong had intended to blow up an M113 armored personnel carrier. They blew up the Lambretta because, loaded down as it was by the weight of the driver and his ten passengers, and all of their baggage and farm produce, the vehicle was heavy enough to trigger the detonator. The ferocious twenty kilograms of TNT the guerrillas put into such mines to be certain of demolishing an M113 ensured that no one would survive. The explosion blasted a crater in the middle of the road seven feet wide and three and a half feet deep. Van saw that Han exploited the atrocity for propaganda purposes, including the staging of a rally against the Viet Cong in a village center near the scene. The propagandizing was unnecessary. The relatives and friends of the dead spent days searching the swamp around the site to be certain that no part of a body was left unburied. They picked up the twisted remnants of the Lambretta and placed them beside the road as a temporary memorial arranging the sandals of the victims around the shards of metal and lighting candles there. 
Later they returned and built a small shrine at the spot and kept a candle lit within it. In a demonstration of the quality of intelligence the farmers could provide when they wanted to, the culprits were caught. They were five turncoat militiamen stationed at an outpost 400 yards farther down the road. The chief of the outpost was one of the traitors. He had supervised the planting of the mine. Han had all five court-martialed and shot by a firing squad in the marketplace of the village center. Despite their conclusion that ordinary Vietnamese would benefit most from a quick end to the war and despite the grisly sights they witnessed daily, Van and Ramsey and Bumgardner and Scotton as well, did not want the United States to stop the war and give up the country. While they were concerned with reducing pain and suffering as much as possible, they believed with equal firmness that there was no choice but to sacrifice the Vietnamese peasants for the higher strategic needs of the United States. On this point, they were in accord with the leaders in Washington whom they served. John McNaughton, a former Harvard Law professor who was McNamara's foreign policy specialist as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, had summarized the Washington view in a memorandum he wrote for McNamara that March. Writing in the efficiency expert style that was in fashion, McNaughton quantified the reasons that justified sending American soldiers to wage a war in South Vietnam. 70% to avoid a humiliating U.S. defeat, to our reputation as a guarantor. 20% to keep SVN and the adjacent territory from Chinese hands. 10% to permit the people of SVN to enjoy a better, freer way of life. The sacrifice of another people for one's own higher strategic aims is a fearful thing when one is living in the midst of those being sacrificed. To Van and his friends, the sacrifice was too cold-blooded unless the Vietnamese were to receive some benefit in return, some reward to redeem the violence. They also believed wholeheartedly that to disregard the welfare of the Vietnamese peasantry was to disregard the long-term interest of Americans. Van had the first draft of the strategy proposal ready by the second week of August. Ramsey and Bumgardner and Scotton approved it, and he distributed the paper to others for comment. The comments and the results of more late-night sessions in Bao Tri and Saigon were incorporated into a final draft of ten pages that he typed and signed a month later. Although Van did not name his friends as co-authors, he did not claim sole credit either. He said in the introduction that the proposal had a number of authors with a wide range of backgrounds and expertise, whose common bond is a combination of field experience in Vietnam and a continuing belief that a viable non-communist democratically oriented government can yet emerge there. The final draft was dated September 10, 1965. The American ground war in the South was beginning in earnest. The Viet Cong had launched their campaign to finish off the Saigon regime with an offensive in the Southern Highlands and along the Central Coast in late spring. By early summer, they were annihilating ARVN battalions as a blast furnace consumes coke. By mid-July, the survival of the regime had become so precarious that Johnson granted a request from Westmoreland for nearly 200,000 U.S. troops to hold on to the country. McNamara came out to Saigon to learn how many more men the general thought he would need to win a war against the guerrillas and the reinforcements they had begun to receive from Hanoi's regulars, the NVA. Westmoreland estimated that he would require another 100,000. He reserved the right to ask for additional troops later should further need arise. Johnson said that Westmoreland could have these 100 Thwosen men too. Army, Marine Corps, and Air Force units were arriving as fast as they could be dispatched. More Navy carriers steamed into position off the southern coast to lend the support of their fighter bombers. They were dubbed the Dixie Station carriers to distinguish them from the carriers already on Yankee Station in the Gulf of Tonkin, above the 17th parallel to bomb the north. By Christmas 1965, Westmoreland was to have almost 185,000 Americans in South Vietnam. In the latter half of August, a week after Van completed his initial draft, the Marines fought the first battle of this new American war. They took on the 1st Viet Cong Regiment in a warren of fortified hamlets and rice paddies boxed by hedgerows and bamboo thickets on the central coast in northern Quang Ngai, the home province of Ho's disciple, Pham Van Dong. The guerrilla regulars had moved into the area to attack an expeditionary airfield the Marines had built on a stretch of beach just across the border in adjacent Quang Tin province. Victor Krulak, now wearing three stars as commanding general of the Fleet Marine Force Pacific, had picked the site for the airfield the previous year in a bit of forethought. 
He had also given it a name after discovering that the beach had none. He had named it with a souvenir of his years as a lieutenant in Shanghai, calling it Chu Lai, the phonetics of the Chinese characters for his name. Two battalions of Marines assaulted from the sea and landed behind the guerrillas from helicopters. They went after the Viet Cong with tanks mounting conventional cannon and flamethrowers, armored amphibian tractors, and another tracked killer known as the Antos, with four recoilless cannon on its armored hull. At a word over the radio, the five-inch guns of the Seventh Fleet destroyers Orlek and Prichet and the eight-inchers in the turrets of the cruiser, Galveston shattered the horizon. The marine howitzers and the big mortars ashore also responded to the calls. The barrels burned from hurling thousands of shells. The air overhead was never empty of fighter bombers from five marine squadrons, because marine riflemen, the grunts as they called themselves in these Vietnam years, do not depend for air support on the vagaries of the Air Force or on the regular Navy planes from the carriers. The Marines have their own Air Force, and Marine aviators are masters at blasting away for the infantry. The A-4 Skyhawks and F-4 Phantom Jets flashed in on the deck. Viet Cong machine guns be damned. The pilots laying the bombs and napalm on target and rocketing and strafing within 200 feet of their brothers in need. Most of those guerrillas who could still do so slipped out between the marine positions after dark on the first day. All organized resistance ceased by the evening of the second. One battalion of the 1st Viet Cong Regiment had been reduced to a frightened remnant and another battalion badly hurt. The marines claimed to have killed 614 guerrillas and to have captured 109 weapons. The price was 51 marines dead and 203 wounded. Three Amtraks armored amphibious tractors, and two tanks were knocked out by recoilless cannons and grenades, and a number of others were damaged. The helicopters had lots of bullet holes. I got back to South Vietnam in time to fly up to the battlefield the day after the fighting. I had left the UPI after my first two years in Vietnam, gone to work for the New York Times, and been sent to Indonesia as the paper's correspondent there. Charlie Moore, who had resigned from Henry Luce's Time magazine in 1963 after it attacked the resident Vietnam correspondents, had become Saigon bureau chief for the Times in the summer of 1965. He asked me to return to cover the war with him. R. W. Johnny Apple Jr. joined us later. The Marines spoke with amazement of the stamina of their new enemy. There was a brigadier general at the battlefield command post, a short man with a pencil mustache named Frederick Karch a veteran of Saipan and Iwo Jima and other islands of World War II. I asked him if he had been surprised. I thought that once they ran up against our first team they wouldn't stand and fight, he said. I made a miscalculation. Van thought that with the blood of American soldiers about to be shed in large quantities, their leaders in Saigon and Washington might feel compelled to face up at last to the failings of the Saigon regime and to the U.S. mistakes of the past 20 years. As he said in his proposal for a new strategy, he entitled the 10-page proposal, Harnessing the Revolution in South Vietnam. The idea was to gain the sympathy of the peasants by capturing the social revolution from the communists in American raw. The short-range goal was to utilize this peasant support to destroy the Viet Cong. The long-range goal was to foster the creation of a different kind of government in Saigon, a national government responsive to the dynamics of the social revolution, a South Vietnamese government that could endure after the American soldiers had fought and the living had gone home. U.S. policy in South Vietnam had been blind and destructive, Van said, because ironically Americans had been inhibited by their image of themselves as a people who opposed colonialism and championed self-determination. Apparently, for fear of tarnishing our own image, we have refused to become overtly involved in the internal affairs of governing, to the extent necessary to ensure the emergence of a government responsive to a majority of its people, he wrote. It is a scathing indictment of our political awareness that we have sat idly by while many patriotic and non-communist Vietnamese were literally forced to ally themselves with a communist-dominated movement in the belief that it was their only chance to secure a better future. Van then laid out a program to start an American-stimulated process of social change a positive alternative that could appeal to the majority of the peasantry and gradually split off from the guerrilla movement, the true patriots and revolutionaries now allied to it. He presented the program as an experiment, 
because he hoped that moving into the strategy with a step rather than might help overcome resistance to the thought of behaving like a colonial power. The experiment would begin in January 1966, when three or more provinces would be selected and isolated from the warlordism of the Saigon side. A separate chain of command would be set up directly from Saigon to the chiefs of the experimental provinces, bypassing the corps and division commanders. The province chief would become supreme in his domain. The civilian ministries and the armed forces would send him qualified personnel to serve as district chiefs and to staff the province and district governments, but he could dismiss anyone at any time and choose a replacement. He would control all funds and material aid that entered the province and administer them through flexible and simplified procedures that would be drawn up for the experimental provinces. HP would also control all military units stationed in his province, including regular ARVN. The division and corps commanders could give him orders only during interprovincial operations, and care would be taken to see that these did not disrupt pacification programs. The chiefs of the experimental provinces were to be granted independence from the Saigon warlords so that their American advisors could direct them from behind the scenes. The advisory effort was to be drastically reorganized in order to be certain that the direction given was effective. The confusion and lack of common sense in the pacification programs of the Saigon ministries were mirrored in the behavior of the different American agencies in South Vietnam. In theory, AID had primary responsibility for the civilian pacification program. In fact, the CIA and USIS ran their own uncoordinated programs. Westmoreland's MACV headquarters, in turn, administered a separate military pacification effort. Van wanted a unified advisory structure in the test provinces. All of the American advisors, whether civilian or military, were to be pulled together into a team under a team leader who would be the senior American advisor for the province and the counterpart of the province chief. He could be either a civilian or a military man, Van said, but he should be selected with a care equal to the importance of his position. Given the control he would exercise over the province chief, the senior American advisor would be the real goxerner of the province. In another ploy to try to gain acceptance by promoting his scheme as an experiment, Van suggested a three-year test for the strategy in the three or more provinces selected with the hope that highly successful results might dictate expansion sooner. He was personally convinced progress would be so rapid that the program would soon be applied all over South Vietnam. With the material benefits it could offer, the United States could generate an astonishing reaction from the peasantry once corruption was eliminated, and the American millions were getting down to the poor instead of being siphoned into the feeding trough of the Saigon hogs. Van and his friends thought there was still time for the United States to steal the social revolution from the communists, because they had been struck by how shallow Viet Cong domination was in many parts of the countryside. This thinness of control, as Van referred to it, was the major reason he and Ramsey were able to move around Hao Nghia with such relative freedom. Bumgardner and Scotton had often been surprised by the same thing elsewhere. The guerrillas had progressed so rapidly since 1963 that in large areas, they had not yet had an opportunity to train enough village and hamlet administrators and to indoctrinate the population sufficiently to solidify their rule. Van and Ramsey noticed the difference when they went into the old rubber plantation sections of Kuchi district where there had been communist organizing among the plantation workers before World War II and the Viet Minh had found a ready base against the French. No children laughed and shouted for gum and candy in these hamlets. Everyone, adult and child, had a cold look. Van and Ramsey never dared to stay more than a few minutes. These peasants were as sensitive to Americans being their edgemies as they had been to the French. As Ramsey was to put it, the pattern of struggle under party leadership had gone on long enough for what was in the mold to set. In much of the rest of Hao Nia, the population did not seem so strongly bonded to the Viet Cong that they could not be weaned away with the right program of opportunity and material incentives. However antagonistic they might be to the Saigon soldiery and other representatives of the regime, and whatever they might think of the United States as a nation, they were friendly to individual Americans. They seemed to regard Americans as decent people of good intentions. At a minimum, they were ambivalent, like the schoolteacher at So Do. Van and Ramsey had sometimes found this to be true, even of young men they knew were local guerrillas. 
Van made a plea in his paper to leave the Vietnamese peasants in their homes and on the land they cherished, so that their allegiance could be won by bettering their lives, and the countryside reconquered through them. His experience with the Strategic Hamlet program in 1962 and 1963 had taught him that forced relocation was a cruel folly. He was alarmed by a tendency among the American military to think, like Colonel Chin, the commander of the 25th Division in Hao Nghia, that a quicker and more certain method was to empty the countryside by driving the peasants into refugee camps around the district towns, in effect, simply to blow away Mao Zedong's sea of the people in which the guerrilla fish swam. To Van's dismay, Chin, with the support of the 25th Division advisors, had declared several populated sections of Qu Chi district free bombing zones in August. A helicopter equipped with a loudspeaker flew over them, telling the peasants to move out or face the consequences. Van called the action idiocy in his monthly report to USAM headquarters. There were already 8,200 refugees in Haungia, surviving on handouts from USAM because the Saigon authorities would do nothing substantial for most of them. Roland Anthus had devised the free bombing zone system in 1962 as yet another way to generate targets and keep his pilots busy. The corps and division commanders and the province chiefs were encouraged to delineate specific zones of guerrilla dominance in which anything that moved could be killed and anything that stood could be leveled. The zones were also called free strike zones and free fire zones because they were open to unrestricted artillery and mortar fire and strafing by a helicopter machine gunners once they had been marked for free bombing. By the summer of 1965, the system was being exploited to achieve a measure of destruction Anthus had probably not imagined, expanding constantly as more and more Viet Cong-held regions were marked off with red lines on the maps. Anthus had usually contented himself with sparsely populated areas. Now, as in Kuchi, well-populated sections were among those being condemned. Moreover, the free bombing zones were only an indication of what was occurring. Many other guerrilla-controlled areas were being treated in virtually the same way, even though they had not yet been officially condemned through the pre-planned strike system for interdiction bombing that Anthus had also put in place. At the end of August 1965, the U.S. Air Force announced it had destroyed five Thuosan structures in South Vietnam that month and damaged 2,400 others. In August, U.S. Home headquarters had transferred Ramsey temporarily to Binh Dinh, the most heavily populated province on the central coast, to help with the mass of refugees flowing out of the countryside there. Of an estimated 850 Thuosan people in the province, about 85,000 had fled their homes, primarily to escape the bombing and shelling. Ramsey had written Van that he was running into stories of airstrikes in Binh Dinh, which make anything in Hao Nghia pale into insignificance. The official explanation in Washington was that the homeless were refugees from communism, who were voting with their feet. Some, mainly Catholics and the families of militiamen, were fleeing the Viet Cong. The talk in the upper levels of the embassy and MACV and USOM was that while the flow of refugees was a temporary embarrassment, the refugees were a long-term asset because they were now under Saigon's control. They could be cared for and indoctrinated and someday sent back to rebuild their homes as loyal citizens, or given vocational training and jobs in small industrial parks that could be built on the sites of the shantytown camps that were springing up. Ramsey had written Van that he disagreed. No one is about to convince me that such conglomerations of demoralized people are an asset under any conditions of amelioration USOM has brought itself to accept, he said. Wholesale dislocation of the peasantry would only worsen the problems the United States faced in South Vietnam, Van warned in his strategy proposal, and it was profoundly unjust. We expected an unsophisticated, relatively illiterate rural population to recognize and oppose the evils of communism even when it is cleverly masked by front organizations, he wrote. We have damned those who did not give wholehearted support to GVN without seriously questioning whether GVN was so constituted or motivated that it could expect loyalty and support from its people. As an example of the unthinking cruelty reflected in the American attitude, Van quoted a remark by one of the 25th Division advisors to justify Chin's action in Kuchi District. If these people want to stay there and support the communists, then they can expect to be bombed, the advisor had said. 
With the commitment of the American soldier, such ignorance entailed cruelty to Americans, too. To persist in it was to risk the unacceptable, that a successful military venture will be negated by a continued failure of GVN to win its own people. The American soldier was merely buying time, Van warned. The major challenge now facing the U.S. and Vietnam was to use that time to break the communist monopoly on social revolution. The United States, therefore, had the right to act as a benevolent colonial power and push the current regime aside precisely because the need for change was so imperative. Every effort should be made to sell the wisdom of the program he was proposing and enlist their cooperation in reforming their society, Van wrote. But if this cannot be done without compromising the principal provisions of the proposal, then GVN must be forced to accept U.S. judgment and direction. The situation is now too critical, and the investment too great for us to longer tolerate a directionless and floundering effort that is losing the population, hence the war.